Hello, my name is Angela Vitbid, and I'm a public health advisor in the Division of Education and Development at OHRP. This tutorial will explain some of the requirements for convened IRB meetings, including quorum requirements for convening an IRB meeting and voting at a convened meeting. After completing this tutorial, you should have a better understanding of the regulations regarding convening and conducting IRB meetings and how to apply them. This tutorial is the second of a series. You may also wish to view the first one, which covers IRB membership requirements. Let's get started. Human subjects research that requires IRB review may be reviewed at a convened IRB meeting or if it qualifies for expedited review, by the IRB chair or an experienced IRB member or members designated by the IRB chair. This tutorial focuses on the requirements for reviewing research at convened meetings. The HHS regulations at 45 CFR Part 46, Section 108B, set out the minimum membership requirements for a convened IRB review meeting. These are commonly referred to as the quorum requirements. To establish quorum at a convened meeting, a majority of the IRB members must be present, including at least one member whose primary concerns are in non-scientific areas. In addition, if the IRB will be reviewing research involving prisoners, there are additional requirements that will be addressed later in this tutorial. Without meeting the quorum requirements, the IRB cannot review or take action on any research protocols. Each IRB must have a minimum of five members, including at least one member whose primary concerns are in scientific areas, a scientist member, one member whose primary concerns are in non-scientific areas, a non-scientist member, and one member who is not affiliated with the institution aside from serving on the IRB, an unaffiliated member. The regulations require that a majority of the IRB members be present for a convened meeting. The minimum number of members that must be present to meet this requirement is determined by the number of regular voting members, commonly referred to as primary members, listed on the IRB roster. This means that more than half of the total number of primary members listed on the IRB roster must be present for a convened meeting to proceed. The term primary member is used to distinguish them from individuals who are designated as alternates a concept that we will explain in a moment. For now, it's sufficient to know that any alternates must be listed on the IRB roster, but they do not count when determining how many members are needed to constitute a quorum. In order to ensure that full board meetings can be convened when one or more of the primary members are unavailable, or to meet a need for a specific area of expertise, IRBs often include individuals on the IRB roster to serve as alternates to the primary members. When an alternate attends and participates in a meeting, in place of a primary member who is not present, she or he counts toward fulfilling quorum requirements. For example, consider an IRB that has a total of 11 primary members and three alternates on its roster. They will use the number of primary members, 11 in this case, to determine the minimum number of members who must be present to fulfill quorum. The majority of 11 members is six, so six members must be present to establish quorum for a convened meeting. Alternates may count towards quorum only when replacing primary members who are not present. A non-scientist member must be present at every convened IRB meeting. Without a non-scientist member, the meeting cannot proceed, even if enough members are present. If an IRB has a total of 10 primary members on its roster, 
more than half must be present to establish quorum, so at least six members are required. Remember, the regulations also require that at least one of the members in attendance be a non-scientist. Note that the IRB chair is a member and, if present, counts towards quorum. To help meet the requirement that a non-scientist member be present, IRBs may include more than one non-scientist in their membership, or designate one or more alternates for the non-scientist member who can fill in when that member is not available. Although the regulations require that the IRB membership also include at least one scientist and one unaffiliated member, those members do not have to be present for the purpose of meeting quorum requirements. The IRB needs to include a prisoner or prisoner representative if it is reviewing research involving prisoners under subpart C. OHRP recommends that a prisoner representative have a close working knowledge, understanding, and appreciation of prison conditions from a prisoner's perspective. This person cannot be a consultant and must be listed on the IRB roster. This person may be listed as a primary member or alternate. The prisoner representative's presence for the purpose of meeting quorum requirements is only necessary when reviewing research involving prisoners. Note that, when reviewing research involving prisoners, a majority of the primary IRB members listed on the roster, excluding the prisoner representative, must not be associated with the prison or prisons involved outside of their membership on the IRB. The regulations also set out requirements for reviewing and voting on research protocols. After reviewing each protocol, the convened IRB can vote to approve the research, require modifications to secure approval, disapprove the research, or table the research for action at another time. According to the regulations, in order for the research to be approved, it must receive the votes of the majority of members present at the meeting. There may be circumstances when some members choose to abstain when voting on a protocol. For example, they may not feel adequately informed to make a decision or are genuinely undecided. Members who participated in a protocol's review but abstained from voting are still considered to be members present at the meeting. Therefore, they count toward quorum and for calculating what constitutes a majority vote for approving a research study. Consider an IRB with a total of seven primary members on its roster. It convenes to review several research protocols, none of which involve prisoners. The chair is in attendance, along with the non-scientist member, and three additional primary members. Are the quorum requirements met for this IRB to proceed with the meeting? Yes, the quorum requirements are met because a majority of the IRB membership is present, in this case, five of the seven members, including a non-scientist member. Here's another example to consider. An IRB has a total of 11 primary members on its roster. At a convened IRB meeting, five primary members are in attendance, including a non-scientist member. Are the quorum requirements met for this IRB to proceed with the meeting? No. At least six of the 11 members, that is, more than half of 11, must be in attendance, including a non-scientist member, for the quorum requirements to be met. At the next meeting, the quorum requirements are met when seven of the 11 primary members are present including a non-scientist. This convened IRB reviews and discusses a research protocol submitted by Dr. Lee. The seven members voted as follows. Approve, four. Disapprove, two. Abstain, 
1. Was Dr. Lee's study approved by the IRB? Yes, the study was approved by the IRB because a majority of the members present at the meeting, four of the seven in this case, where the abstaining member counts as one of the seven members present, voted to approve the study. The convened IRB then moves on to review Dr. Brown's research. The seven members voted as follows. Approve, three. Disapprove, two. Abstain, two. Was Dr. Brown's research approved by the IRB? No. According to the regulations, for Dr. Brown's research to be approved by the convened IRB, at least four of the seven members present at the meeting, in other words, the majority of those present, must have voted to approve the protocol. Even though there were more approvals than disapprovals, the research falls short of receiving the approval of a majority of those members present at the meeting. Remember that the members who abstain when voting on a protocol still count toward quorum and calculating what constitutes a majority vote for approving a research study. Certain circumstances may require additional attention when determining quorum and counting votes for IRB actions. These special circumstances include when alternates for primary members are present, when IRB administrators or staff who are not IRB members are present, when members have a conflict of interest and recuse themselves. Let's consider each of these situations. As discussed earlier, IRBs may designate alternates for some or all of their primary members to ensure that full board meetings can be convened, even if one or more of the primary members are unavailable. How an institution selects and identifies alternates is left to the institution's discretion, but convened meetings must still meet the quorum requirements, whether the attendees are primary members or alternates. For example, an IRB may designate one or more alternates for their non-scientist members. If a primary non-scientist member cannot attend a meeting, one of the non-scientist alternates can fill the seat vacated by the primary member and be counted toward the quorum requirements. Just as alternates cannot count toward a quorum unless they are replacing a primary member who is not present, alternates also cannot vote unless they are replacing a primary member at the meeting. If institutional policy allows, Alternates may attend the meeting and participate in the discussion even when they are not serving in place of a primary member, similar to how a consultant might participate. Note that even if alternates are not serving in their capacity as an alternate and therefore do not count for quorum or voting purposes, OHRP recommends that their attendance at the meeting be documented. IRB administrative staff who are not IRB members may participate in IRB meetings to facilitate the conduct of the meeting, for example, to document discussion, record votes, etc. However, they cannot count toward quorum or vote with the IRB if they are not listed as members. Note that IRB staff may serve as IRB members as long as they meet the qualifications and requirements for IRB membership that are described in the regulations and are listed as members on the IRB roster. An IRB member who has a conflict of interest with a particular research protocol may not participate in the IRB's review of that protocol, except to provide information requested by the IRB. The conflicted member must recuse her or himself from the discussion of the research protocol and cannot count toward a quorum or vote with respect to that protocol. Note that this is quite different from the situation when a member abstains from voting, in which case the abstaining members present counts towards establishing quorum and calculating what constitutes a majority vote for approving a research study. 
recusal, on the other hand, has the same effect as if the member were not in attendance. The recused member does not count toward quorum or any vote calculations. If a member's recusal breaks the quorum, the IRB cannot proceed with review or voting as it pertains to the affected protocol or protocols. When this occurs, the meeting cannot proceed until a quorum is reestablished. Consider an IRB with a total of 11 primary members. Eight members are present at a meeting, including a non-scientist. Quorum is met, and the IRB proceeds with the convened meeting. The IRB has five research protocols to review. When they get to the third protocol, Dr. Shan, who is a co-PI on the protocol and also a member of the IRB, recuses herself from participating. Can the IRB continue with the review of this protocol? Yes, the IRB can proceed because there are still seven members present at the meeting, which is more than half of 11, including a non-scientist. Note that when voting on this protocol, though, what constitutes a majority vote needs to be adjusted. Following Dr. Shan's recusal from the review, only seven members remain to participate in the convened IRB meeting. According to the regulations, research must be approved by the majority of those members present. In this case, then, the research can be approved when at least four of the seven members vote in favor of this protocol. Whereas, if Dr. Shan were not recused, there would be eight members present, and a vote of five of those members would be needed to approve it. This was how the convened IRB, without Dr. Shan, voted. Approve, three. Disapprove, two. Abstain, two. Was Dr. Shan's research approved by the IRB? No. Even though there were more approvals than disapprovals, Dr. Shan's research couldn't be approved because it was not approved by at least four of the seven members present at the meeting, or a majority of those present. Let's consider a slightly different scenario with the same IRB. What if only six of the 11 members had been present at the start of the meeting? Could the IRB proceed with reviewing Dr. Shan's protocol after her recusal? No, the IRB could not continue with the review of this protocol. The quorum would be lost when Dr. Shan recused herself, assuming an alternate was not available to participate in her place. The IRB administrator might propose to move Dr. Shan's protocol to a later meeting, in which case, could the IRB continue to review the remaining two research protocols? Yes, because a quorum would be reestablished, since Dr. Shan no longer needs to recuse herself, assuming she has no other conflicts with the remaining protocols. The IRB minutes should reflect when the quorum is lost in a meeting and when it is restored. Although there is no regulatory requirement that a recused member who has a conflict leave the room during the IRB meeting while other members review the protocol, OHRP recommends this as best practice. Note that, according to the regulations, institutions must abide by their own policies regarding the IRB's initial and continuing review procedures, regardless of whether the institution's policies go beyond what the regulations require. So if an institution's IRB policy requires that recused members with a conflict of interest leave the room, the institution must follow this policy in order to be compliant with the regulations. Finally, a quorum may also be broken under other circumstances, such as when a member has to leave the meeting early. Again, when this occurs, the meeting cannot proceed until a quorum is re-established. Consider this example. At today's meeting, six of the 11 primary members are present including a non-scientist. Quorum requirements are met because a majority of members are present, including a non-scientist. 
Halfway through the meeting, one of the members is called away to handle a medical emergency. Can the IRB meeting continue? No, the quorum is lost because 5 is not more than half of 11. All IRB activity must stop until the quorum is restored. The IRB minutes should reflect when quorum is lost in a meeting and when it is restored, if it is. Sometimes non-members attend IRB meetings. For example, an IRB may invite experts or consultants with competence in specific areas to advise the committee on issues that require expertise beyond that of the IRB's membership. These experts are not considered IRB members and cannot count toward quorum or vote with the IRB on any actions. The same is true for other observers, such as future IRB members in training, students, volunteers, community observers, IRB administrative staff who are not listed as members on the roster, or investigators conducting research on IRB operations. The regulations do not prohibit observers from attending a convened IRB meeting although institutional policies might. Observers or consultants may participate in discussion at an IRB meeting, but they cannot count toward a quorum or vote on any proposals. When a non-member expert participates in a convened meeting, it must be documented in the minutes. This concludes our review of the quorum and voting requirements for convened IRB meetings. We hope you found it helpful. We focused on the major aspects of the quorum and voting requirements, but encourage you to consult the regulations and OHRP's guidance for more information, particularly the IRB Registration Process FAQs on the OHRP website. Thank you.